Today, we're ex really excited about our topic, um, which is Mexican and Latinx civil rights in the Inland Empire, but through the lens of um, sports like baseball and also other um, interesting types of activism as it relates to uh, labor issues and, and schooling. We were um, lucky to have um, a local product from the Inland Empire, Marco Segueda, who is now at Brown University. Um, and we'll introduce him and um, the scholarship that he does in a, in a few minutes. Um, and then he's will be um, giving a, an, an amazing talk today that will be uh, recorded. And then from there, like always, we'll go into our breakout rooms and um, talk some uh, teacher instruction and curriculum pedagogy with you all. All right. Um, we always want to start by uh, acknowledging that we're on Tongva land here in uh, here in Los Angeles, and that UCLA is on Tongva land. Um, and I'm in Whittier, and I'm currently on Tongva land as well. Um, and so the acknowledgement, the acknowledgement um, is letting our folks know that uh, Tongva Gabrielino peoples are the original caretakers of this, this unceded land that was originally known as Tobangar, um, which is the Los Angeles basin to the Southern Channel Islands. And Okay, Rizal, sorry, wanna... I was trying to find my mute button. Um, also, um, at Cal State San Bernardino, we are on the traditional ancestral lands of the Serrano, also known as the Yahavatam, the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. And um, we recognize that every member of our university community benefits from use and occupation of this land. Um, since the 1965 founding of the university, um, and we have a responsibility to acknowledge and really make these relationships visible with the native people in our communities. Uh, I am currently in the Temecula Valley, and that's the ancestral homelands of the Lucinio people. Uh, we, uh, together we stand on Turtle Island, an indigenous term for the Northern American continent. We're grateful to be able to learn on this piece of Turtle Island. Myself, I'm convening on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Keech and Tongva nations and their neighbors whose ancestors tended to the region. Uh, we now call Southern California for at least 9,000 years. The indigenous stewardships and rightful claims to these lands have never been voluntarily relinquished, nor they're really extinguished. Uh, also, if this is your first time, this is the, we're going to introduce ourselves to you all. If you're a returner, this is just a reminder of who we are in Bitmoji form. I'm over there uh, with the cardigan. Uh, my name is Danny Diaz. I'm the director of the UCLA History Geography Project um, and a former history teacher. Okay, I'll pass it to Don Powell. Uh, Powell. Or Don Powell, go ahead. <laughs> I was like, uh, I'm Don Powell. I'm with uh, RCOE, um, the History Social Science Administrator. We also do uh, a lot of stuff around cultural relevancy. Uh, if you've been hanging out with me lately, you've probably seen me in some ethnic studies circles. And uh, yeah, just excited to, to be here. And uh, we're also joined by a couple of other folks. Uh, I'm Amparo Chavez Gonzalez, um, and I am uh, a teacher coach and a lead facilitator for the UCLA History Geography Project, and I'm very excited to be working with all of you today. Cindy. Okay, well, Cindy, Cindy, I'll, I'll, I think your audio is... Cindy is our associate director. She's an amazing, uh, an amazing associate director. She does some amazing work in ethnic studies and history education. Um, she has a master's in Latin American studies. She was a former teacher. I think she taught everything that she could possibly teach during her years in the classroom. Um, and uh, she is, um, look, look for her in uh, the circles where you find scholarship as well, because Cindy is uh, recently published um, and I think is working on something else to be published, which is really cool. And go ahead, Michelle. Okay, and I'm Michelle Lorimer. I teach at Cal State San Bernardino. I um, do a lot of work with our pre-credential history, social science students, um, and do a lot of other work with you know, teachers in the Inland Empire and, and around California. So I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm a historian with my focus is really on California history, Native American history. Um, and, and now also teaching history. So related to that, on the next slide, 
Um, we are working uh, at Cal State San Bernardino in the history department to establish a community partnership with Riverside County Office of Education. So I just wanted to take a minute or two to promote this. And if anybody on this call or anybody watching it on recording is interested in participating as we develop a leadership team, we'd really love to hear your input. So um, this community partnership is working to establish a history social science uh, program for the Inland Empire based in Cal State San Bernardino's History Department and the Riverside County Office of Education. Currently, we're doing a lot of work with our pre-credential teachers in the History Department to build curriculum for some local history projects. Um, right now, we're working with the California Citrus State Historic Park to build some lesson plans. And, um, and some um, some additional um, work with the Relevancy and History Project based out of UC Riverside. So, um, so what we're looking for is uh, people who are interested in helping us create a vision and a plan for this team. And then also, if any of you are interested in um, working as mentors for some of our pre-credential students. I received a community partnership grant from Cal State San Bernardino that will provide honorariums to some teachers who, who will just you know, help guide some of our students, read over some of their lesson plans that they're constructing and just see if they're realistic, how they might implement them in the classroom, if there are some things that you would like them to improve on. Um, just you know, some basic uh, encouragement and mentorship from the perspective of a teacher. So if you're interested, let me know either in the chat, um, just you know, send me a message or you can email me or do both. Um, we're trying to get a team together within the next couple weeks and then we're gonna build on it over the spring to by the end of the spring, by, by summer, have like a, a vision ready. So that's my little plug. A lot of the work that we're doing is based on the work that we've been doing in East Side Stories and in these TPS work in the Inland Empire over the last um, two years. So, so a lot of it should be familiar to many of you. All right, thanks. Thanks yeah. you guys for letting me have the time to, to ask for that. Yeah, of course. And, and I think there's a couple of follow-up questions for you in the chat, Michelle. Okay, I'll look, thanks. Um, so uh, we're going to spend the, the first um, 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so before uh, Dr. Osegueva's talk, um, talking about some uh, Library of Congress, Teacher with Primary Sources, um, important information. So I'm going to share with you some important information um, and uh, give you an opportunity to kind of explore the Library of Congress. Um, so these are the goals of this workshop, and for those of you who are new, TPS is Teaching with Primary Sources. It's a project created by the Library of Congress to support history teachers. You can kind of think of TPS as like their social media kind of teacher hub. It's a place for teachers to engage with one another. You could create primary source sets and share them and have access to other customized primary source sets. Um, that teachers uh, create using the Library of Congress online resources. Um, so this work is funded by the Library of Congress and their TPS network. And um, the partnership um, is consists of the UCLA History Geography Project, uh, Michelle, who represents Cal State San Bernardino as our historian and scholar, and then um, our partners at the Riverside County Office of Education, um, where, where uh, Don is um, coming from. So the the goals of Eastside Story, um, in addition to kind of introducing you all to the Library of Congress, um, more importantly, is to uncover the hidden history. We're saying hidden in quotes um, because it's it's not hidden anymore, right? We're bringing it out. Um, there, we're sort of learning something new about uh, about this rich history with all of these sessions, and there, um, you know, we post all of the recordings on YouTube. So if you haven't seen the other ones, you can always check them out here. But we want to uncover these stories. Um, and then we want to 
um, emphasize the experiences of groups whose stories are often minimized or left out. So you'll see we've been very intentional about highlighting AAPI last time and this time Mexican Latinx community. Um, and then the last one, which is coming up on March 10th, is looking at youth culture in the Inland Empire and how music and dance and, and even fashion were forms of, uh, of resistance and uh, community building and, and um, joy. So we want to highlight those examples in this work, and we've been um, doing our best to do so, and then providing you all resources um, to integrate them into your classroom. Okay, Again, and, uh, and if you have any questions about any of this in the chat, just please ask, and I'll do my best to respond, or somebody on my team um, will definitely have the answer uh, for you. So let's go ahead and jump into this overview. Um, of the Library of Congress and this network. So uh, I'm not going to tell you what the Library of Congress is. You know what the Library of Congress is. Uh, it's it's uh, the, the National Archives, right, for, for uh, the United States, and it's home to a, a massive amount of different types of documents and sources and books. Um, and they have uh, sh started to focus, well, it's not started, they've been doing this for a while, but they now um, have so a bunch of resources for teachers. They understand that history teachers are always looking for sources. So the TPS network, which was created by the Library of Congress includes classroom materials and primary source sets and even directions on how you can use primary sources or instructions on how to use primary sources in the classroom, which were really helpful about 10 years ago or 15 years ago when a lot of that work was just maybe 10 years ago. It was starting to be done. Um, I think you are probably really familiar with, you know, using primary sources in your classroom at this point. Um, the website also has some really cool primary source analysis tools. Um, from anything to doing oral history projects to analyzing newspapers, there's, there's handouts and tools on the website as well. Um, and then there's all these op options to explore different facets of the TPS network in the Library of Congress. They have different collections, they have exhibits, um, they have some really cool music source sets that's just audio. Um, so there's like some really good thing, things on this website and they've recently updated and had like Google search in their web, on their web page so you get better results um, and then opportunities to engage with other teachers through the TPS network. So um, I, what time is it right now? 4.20, okay, so let's go maybe five to eight minutes and uh, I want you all to engage in a, a Library of Congress scavenger hunt. Um, and let me see if I, if I could click this. Um, are you all able to see what I'm loading? Somebody gives me a thumbs yes. up. It, it looks a Google Doc. All right, thank you, Mark. Kathy. So this is what this looks like. And there's a chat that's going to be, that's, there's a link that's in the chat. And if you all can just kind of go through this, this isn't being graded and you don't have to complete it, but it's just an opportunity for you to start like digging into the Library of Congress website in preparation for um, a lesson that you want to create. Remember, there's an option to in as part of this series to design a lesson using the Library of Congress TPS template, um, which I'm going to talk about in our next session. Um, you can use that template to design a lesson, and if you submit that lesson, then you will, um, you'll get um, a stipend from us, or um, I think in the form of a gift card, um, Visa gift card or Amazon gift card, I, I have to check, but there will be some compensation for you doing this, and the lesson template, I would say, is pretty straightforward. It's not very complicated, but in order to build the lesson, you need to get familiar. So let's go ahead with the website. So let's go ahead and spend um, about seven minutes. I'll check in in five minutes to see how you're doing. You can shut your cameras off and uh, start exploring the Library of Congress. And if you have any questions about the steps, uh, unmute and ask, or just drop that question in the chat. Okay, um, so does anybody have any clarifying questions about what we're doing for the next seven minutes? Okay, great, so go ahead, explore, and um, I'll touch base with you. I'll check in with you all in about five, about five minutes to see how you're doing.
So it's 428 and that might have felt like uh, maybe we rushed it a bit. You're more than welcome to explore the Library of Congress using this uh, scavenger hunt handout. Um, we've also know that some people have had trouble with the TPS network in particular. Uh, so if you do have trouble with that between now and our next meeting, um, feel free to email us or we can talk about it at our next meeting um, as we're gonna spend a few more minutes exploring um, the Library of Congress at that last session. So uh, let me go ahead and share my screen again and we'll jump right back into this. And if anybody has any questions, this is a great time to unmute and ask. All right, so the next steps, um, and you can find these links on your agenda. Between now and March 10th, please sign up for the TPS network. It's just kind of, it's gonna ask you to register, create an account. Um, that's important. And, and then also take a moment to review the lesson plan template. Um, and it's literally gonna take you a moment. It's a really uh, brief template. We're not talking about like the, uh, like the Hunter seven step <laughs> a lesson plan format or any of the other into through beyond type of lesson plans. This is a very straightforward lesson plan, but do yourself a favor if you wanna submit a lesson, if you're planning on doing it, just review the template just to see what the, what the workload is, is like, okay? All right, I'll do a quick pause, see if anybody has any questions about this, okay? Well, thank you all so much. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and pass the mic to Michelle, who's gonna introduce our guest scholar today. Okay. Um, we are super excited to have Dr. Marco Zugueda here with us. Uh, we had him speak with us last, last year, and I, I think that his talk is really enlightening. Um, Dr. Osegueda is an Andrew W. Mellon Gateway Fellow at Brown University and soon to be assistant professor. He is an Inland Empire native and alumni of Cal State San Bernardino. Uh, his work focuses on Latinx history, Mexican American history, labor, race, ethnicity, recreation, and public history. He has a particular focus on the Inland Empire and the Mexican American community's significant role in historical understandings of civil rights, race, culture, labor, and urban renewal. Thank you again for joining us so we can really spend more time learning about your important work. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen real quick. Um, let's see. Can you all see, is that, does that appear, Danny, Michelle? Yeah. Good. Okay. All right, yeah. first, um, uh, let me thank you all for the invitation to be in conversation with you. Um, this is a, a great initiative that the History Geography Project is undertaking and I, um, I just hope that I can contribute to it in uh, any way that I can. Um, I'm especially excited to participate today since I am from the Inland Empire. I was uh, raised in San Bernardino. I attended San Bernardino Public Schools. Uh, I went to Rio Vista Elementary, Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School on, on the west side of San Bernardino. I also uh, graduated from Cajon High School and studied uh, my, for my undergrad at, at Cal State San Bernardino. So I'm, I'm very much invested in and care about these communities in the IE. And I uh, really just wanna applaud the work of the History Geography Project and their team for, for making the effort to incorporate these systematically excluded and erased historical narratives into our, our public school curriculum. So, so I hope that I may offer some worthwhile ideas to that end. So this, for this presentation, I wanted to offer a pretty simple overarching question for you all to consider as we think about civil rights in the Inland Empire as related to uh, ethnic Mexicans and Latinx people. And that question is, uh, in what ways did ethnic Mexicans, uh, and when I say ethnic Mexicans, I, I mean uh, Mexican immigrants and, and their progeny, right, Mexican Americans. Uh, how did they and, and other Latinx populations advocate for civil rights in the Inland Empire? Or in other words, uh, I want you all to think about how the demands for civil rights manifested themselves among these groups of people in this region. Now, this is a very straightforward question, but one that's direct enough that it will have us thinking about how civil rights developed in the region. Uh, before we address some of the civil rights uh, and social movements that occurred in the Inland Empire, I wanna provide you all with some historical context that brings us to uh, the particular era that I wanna focus in on, which is the 1920s through the World War II era. 
So I don't want to spend too much time on this particular historical setup, especially since I know many of you all covered this history in previous workshops, especially with the great presentations uh, by Michelle Warmer, Megan Asaka, and Stephen uh, Myrna Terrell. Uh, but nonetheless, I do want to cover some of this. So though some of this history has been covered uh, in the previous workshops, I think it's important to point out that at the end of the 19th century, uh, the region that we now refer to as the Inland Empire was experiencing major transformations uh, as white settler and especially uh, white settler merchant capitalists made their way into the region. And this is an era where you see the establishment of the predominant economic industries that came to define the Inland Empire during that time and for much of the 20th century. And of course, uh, the industries that I'm referring to are agricultural citrus farming and railroading. So during the 1880s, you see the Santa Fe Railroad establishing major Western operations in San Bernardino when it completed its transcontinental line through the Cajon Pass. Uh, shortly thereafter, the Southern Pacific also followed suit by establishing a, a strategic rail yard in, in nearby Colton. So during this time, the, the citrus industry grew astronomically and was mutually nurtured by the Santa Fe and Southern Pacific Railroad lines. Along with the investment of capital into citrus farms and irrigation, uh, refrigerated boxcars that allowed the distribution of citrus products across national markets. And of course, uh, most, the most significant aspect of all of this is is that we should all note that this is all made possible with the, the settler violence that dispossessed the region's native peoples. And along with that, the labor of these native peoples, you also had uh, the labor of um, uh, immigrants of Chinese and Mexican descent that are helping to build these industries in, in the IE. So if I may direct your attention to these two images, we certainly see how agriculture and railroading are being promoted as the primary economic engines of the region. This is from a 1914 article in the San Bernardino Sun, which is uh, essentially lauding San Bernardino as this kind of center of what becomes known as the Inland Empire. And, and by my account, uh, the term Inland Empire is first used uh, by local boosters in the San Bernardino Sun as early as 1911. Um, oh, sorry. In tandem with the region's economic growth during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, you also begin to see a sizable Mexican migrant labor force simultaneously making its way into these inland towns during this era, especially uh, during the 1910s and 20s. And this is explained primarily by the desire of the citrus and railroad industries uh, who covet a source of labor that they perceived to be controllable and certainly cheap cheap in terms of the wages that they would pay these migrant laborers. So you see uh, inland railroad and citrus contractors during this time luring Mexican migrants into these inland towns during the 1910s. Uh, of course, a major factor in all of this uh, is the Mexican Revolution. So the Mexican Revolution during the 1910s, coupled with labor recruitment tactics known as renganche, uh, you see a subsequently uh, a massive increase in Mexican migration, especially into the Southwest, and that included uh, places like the Inland Empire. Now, the common sentiment amongst railroad and citrus agricultural employers was that these migrant laborers would temporarily fill these positions and then return to Mexico within a year or two. By 1920, however, Mexicans, uh, on the contrary, they, they uh, began planning routes within the Inland Empire towns that they were working in. So you consequently see during this time period, the late 1910s, the early 1920s, the emergence of colonias and, and segregated barrios in places like the west side of San Bernardino, the northern end of Corona, in places like Casablanca and Riverside, uh, South Colton, and you'll see Mexican communities forming in Redlands, uh, Ontario, Cucamonga, and Pomona as well. Historians such as Matt Garcia, Jose Lamillo, most recently uh, Genevieve Carpio, they've explored these histories. So I definitely recommend that you all seek out the, the work of these scholars if you wanna better understand some of this history. And of course, uh, my forthcoming book will also look at this, this particular history as well. So if you take a look at these population figures in this slide, you can see that there's a, a sizable native born Mexican population by 1930 in places like Ontario, Pomona, Redlands, Riverside, and San Bernardino, and San Bernardino being the, the largest by far, right? 
So once Mexicans begin to permanently settle, uh, they immediately encounter racial segregation in housing, schools, labor, and in public spaces. Here, for instance, is an example of a segregated uh, Mexican school in North Corona in 1920 at Washington Elementary School. Uh, these schools were essentially established for Mexican children to attend so that they would not, um, as educators during the time alleged, local school boards at the time alleged, diminish the education of some of the, the white pupils and their white counterparts by holding them back through supposed language barriers. Uh, of course, there are a slew of other justifications uh, that are uh, very much uh, parallel of the anti-Mexican nativist sentiments of the time um, that was being applied to kind of uh, exclude Mexican children from attending uh, integrated schools. Here's another example of a Mexican only school in the Inland Empire. This is Ramona Elementary. Uh, this is a class photograph from 1947. And this image here kind of allows us to visualize how this uh, segregation looked like. And um, <clears throat> the history behind the school is that in 1926, uh, San Bernardino School Board constructed a building for Ramona Elementary School. It intended to use it as a vocational training facility for Mexican children. So this type of segregated schooling uh, was actually very commonplace throughout the Southwest. Historian Gilbert Gonzalez has shown by the mid 1930s, these types of schools were so prevalent that roughly 80, 85% of school districts in the Southwest segregated Mexican students. Uh, Ramona Elementary, um, so, as some of you may know, tragically burned down a little over a year ago. Uh, I don't think there was uh, any part of the building that was salvaged, unfortunately. So that was a heartbreaking loss for the residents of San Bernardino who many from the community re actually remember Ramona fondly, right? Despite, despite it being a segregated school, uh, they actually re really re remember it fondly as being a, one of these sites in the community where a lot of them formed formidable memories in. Here's another example of a segregated school in San Bernardino in 1944. This is the Mills School in South San Bernardino off of uh, Waterman Avenue and Mill Street. And I show this image here because I want you all to uh, uh, know that these experiences of segregation for ethnic Mexicans parallel those of the various black communities of the Inland Empire. So black children were also segregated in such schools as well. And Mill School was located adjacent to the Valley Truck Farms community in South San Bernardino, where there was a uh, sizable black community. Of course, many of you already might know um, Dorothy Ingram, who is pictured here at center with San Bernardino County's first African-American school teacher. And uh, she was just a, such an important figure in San Bernardino and Inland Empire history. So it's important to note that these forms of segregation did not just apply to schools. Um, they were also present in almost every facet of daily life, including the workplace, housing, uh, in public spaces such as theaters and restaurants. Um, I want to turn your attention now to this particular image to give you a, a very clear instance of how Mexicans in the Inland Empire united to advocate for their rights. And this particular example is of how they did so in the workplace. This image here is perhaps of the first Mexican workers union formed in the Inland Empire. It's uh, the Asociación de Trabajadores Unidos, or the United uh, Workers Association. This union formed out of Colton in May of 1917 and consisted of workers from Colton Cement Plant, uh, the Packing House and Citrus Fields, uh, the Southern Pacific Railroad as well. And what's interesting about this particular image is that these same workers, amongst many others throughout the Inland Empire, uh, one month prior, in April of 1917, they were part of a larger uh, regional strike that happened throughout the San Bernardino Valley, where workers walked off of rail yards, not only at the Southern Pacific in Colton, but also at the Santa Fe in San Bernardino. Uh, citrus workers simultaneously walked off of agricultural fields. Over 100 Mexican workers at the Colton, the, the Colton cement plant were subsequently discharged by the company 
for their efforts in trying to unionize other Mexican workers. So in essence, in uh, April of 1917, one month before this union was formed, there was a large coordinated strike that occurred throughout the San Bernardino Valley where workers were protesting low wages. And in fact, uh, much of these unionizing efforts were in response to wage cuts by the Santa Fe Railroad in, in San Bernardino. Uh, along with that, they were also uh, demanding an eight hour day instead of their 10 hour plus uh, work days. They were also protesting the, the dangerous conditions that many of them faced within the workplace. So for me, this is a very uh, stark example of how Inland Empire Mexican populations were uniting in efforts to advocate for the rights in the face of exploitation and discrimination in labor and in the workplace. And very often, uh, this is the type of organizing that matches and corresponds with our traditional notions of what civil rights activism looks like. But I wanna make the case that our understanding of civil rights and how movements surrounding civil rights, I want to argue that they manifest themselves in, in ways that are less often recognized. Uh, so let me turn your attention to this image here and bring the conversation back to segregation. So as I mentioned, segregation did not just apply to schools. Uh, it was present in almost every facet of daily life, including labor, housing, in public spaces like theaters and restaurants. Uh, and it even permeated into recreational and leisure spaces like public municipal parks and swimming pools. So even though Mexicans were excluded from these spaces, we, we still found ways to create and forge our own venues for recreation, leisure, and sport. Here, for example, we have a photo of the San Bernardino Colton Centrales baseball team posing for a, for a team picture at Cubs Park. And this was located in South Colton in the La Paloma Barrio. And this is taken in 1930. Uh, Cubs Park was located within a multifaceted recreational complex known as El Corralon or the Big Corral. And El Corralon was Mexican owned. Um, it was owned by a Mexican merchant by the name of Juan Caldera who provided not only um, a baseball diamond for the, the Mexican Barrio teams to play on but he also provided the community with a, a swimming pool, uh, boxing facilities, and even a bullfighting ring at El Corralon. So although Mexicans were segregated, we're, we're still able to see how we opened our own sites of recreation, have our own spaces by essentially creating them even without the support of local municipalities. So sites like El Corralon really demonstrate this type of ingenuity that the Mexican community had in terms of still creating these spaces for themselves. And this team photo here is an early example of the barrio baseball and softball teams that played within a network of other uh, Mexican teams across the, the Inland Empire. Uh, here's a picture of the swimming pool that was located at El Corralon. I, I really love this picture here. It's, um, it shows the Mexican community uh, swimming, enjoying uh, a day. As you can see, this is a it's, a, it's a community event. People here are, are having a, a blast. And you even see this band here on the right of this image playing live music. Um, I, I also argue, you know, that, that access to these types of sites, these recreational and leisure sites was probably one of the most coveted public spaces uh, for any community. It was a site uh, to kind of a break from the laborious work week, to have a sense of community, to make memories and, and primarily have a, a site for, for joy, right? And so these recreational and leisure sites are, are really important to keep in mind when we think about social movements and, and civil rights. Here we have an image of the San Bernardino Colton Centrales at the San Bernardino uh, Santa Fe Road, Railroad Yard. Um, as you can see in this picture, this is also quite an event. Um, here you see the Centrales playing uh, a team from Veracruz, Mexico. This is actually the Cordoba Cafeteros, which is actually a, a professional team that still plays the day. So you can see these games, although they operated regionally within the Inland Empire, you also have these transnational instances where local teams from the Inland Empire are playing uh, against some of the, the Mexican teams from Mexico, right? 
it was pretty common to see Mexican communities clear out their own fields, make their own makeshift baseball diamonds as they were limited in their options in terms of access to local public parks. One example of how Mexicans kind of uh, DIY'd some of these baseball fields can be here, seen here in this 1947 image of a decommissioned army truck pulling a, a train rail to clear and, dra uh, and drag a, a rocky field before a game on the corner of Arrow Highway and Hermosa Avenue and Rancho Cucamonga. Now this field is what some of the barrio locals called Yonke Stadium. Uh, it's a play on words on, on Yankee Stadium, obviously, but also yon Yonke is uh, Spanish slang for, for a junkyard as well. So there was some, some humor in the, in the way they also approached these games. Here's another image of uh, Yonke Stadium in, in Cucamonga, one of the games. You really had a widespread community effort go into these games, which were often played on Sunday afternoons. They would, not, they would often attract uh, hundreds and at times thousands of spectators from the barrios. Um, it was a weekly tradition for many people to get out of Sunday morning mass, head out to, and then head out to watch their local baseball or softball teams play. And really it was a significant cultural gathering as well. You had food vendors that would sell Mexican food. Occasionally you had live Mexican music being played at the games. And you also had a Spanish language play-by-play -play over the megaphones at the games uh, on occasion as well. And in this image here, we can see a, a sobador was also on hand. Uh, sobador is basically a, a masseuse. And so for many of these weekend warrior baseball players, they had to keep in mind that they worked during the week. So at times they would have a, these sobadores on hand to make sure none of the players would, would uh, hurt or rub or hurt their ankles, right? So they would rub their ankles if they twisted it so that they could ensure that they could return to their, their jobs at the railroads or at, at the citrus fields the following day. So very much a, a, uh, an important cultural site as well. Um, I'd like to cycle back to this image of the Corona Washington uh, Elementary School that we saw earlier, because I wanna point out that this photo features future players for the Corona Athletics, which included uh, Natividad Tito Cortez, who's in the back row, sixth from the right, and Ray Delgadillo, who's fifth, fifth from the right. So Ray and Tito Cortez, these two were amongst the first players for the all Mexican team known as the Corona Athletics, which were one of the more well-known teams from the region. Here's Tito Cortez on the left of the athletics posing for a photo. Tito Cortez was a great, a great pitcher during this time. In fact, he threw an astonishing uh, five no hitters while playing for the athletics. And he even played professionally within the minor leagues for uh, a major league baseball organization. And in fact, many players from the Inland Empire went on to play in the major leagues, perhaps most notably is uh, Camilo Carrion of the Colton Mercuries who went on to be drafted by the Chicago White Sox in the early 1950s. So a lot of these, uh, these players were pathbreaking in, in many ways. Uh, but anyway, Tito Cortez in this team photo is shown third row, third from the left, and Ray Delgadillo is on the third row, second from the right. Both of them, them went to these uh, segregated schools, so the Washington Elementary School. And they also worked in the Lemon Groves in Corona as well. Uh, a lot of the stories uh, surrounding, especially Corona teams can be seen in uh, Jose Alamillo's work. Um, uh, so I encourage you all to, to check out Jose Alamillo's work for more on this particular history, especially as it relates to Corona and Mexican American sports. Now women and, and girls also played the game. Um, here we have Carmen Lujan in 1936 posing uh, in her La Paloma South Colton Barrio. At the age of 12 or 13, uh, Lujan began playing for the Colton Mercury Senoritas. Uh, for five years, she played second base for the Senoritas as they traveled to play other women's uh, Barrios teams. And here on the right, you can see uh, this is a, uh, after World War II, um, this team was formed after World War II. During the war, Carmen uh, worked as a Rosie the Riveter at uh, the Norton Air Force Base in San Bernardino. Once the war was over, uh, she began to play softball again. And this is with a, a new team called the San Bernardino Cherokees uh, women's team that was formed when the war conclu concluded. Um, I wanted to share this because I I'm extremely uh, proud about this. Um, in 
I'm, I've done research with the Latino Baseball History Project at Cal State San Bernardino. And uh, Carmen Lujan was uh, very generous. Uh, her family was very generous in donating her uniform from the 1930s when she played for the Colton Mercury Senoritas to the Smithsonian uh, so that it could be showcased and preserved in perpetuity uh, at the National Museum of American History. And it's actually on display now at, at their national exhibit uh, called Playball, uh, Latinos and, and Baseball. Um, so uh, very important. Now, now this, this uh, very rare women's team, Mexican-American women's team uniform is now uh, in the Smithsonian collections. Here we have the San Bernardino Raiderettes. The San Bernardino Raiderettes were sponsored uh, by the Catholic Church. Um, you often had businesses, Mexican-American owned businesses sponsoring these teams as well. So it was really a, a crucial community effort to support these teams. And this is uh, the San Bernardino Raiderettes. Um, uh, you can see here, uh, they're wearing these uh, Levi's jeans. Many of them, they, they borrowed them from their older siblings. Uh, and it was really kind of a, a DIY family and community effort to even provide such equipment as uniforms or baseball uh, gloves. But this is um, a, a great image that I love from San Bernardino's West Side. Here are the Casablanca Busy Bees in the, from the 1940s on the left and the Corona Debs on the right. This is a, a Meat Lock Cafe baseball team uh, from the late 1940s. First, I, I just want to acknowledge the Mila Cafe. It's still the it's the longest operating Mexican-owned restaurant uh, that's in the Inland Empire, and it's still in operation today on the west side of San Bernardino. It was founded in 1937 by a Mexican immigrant woman by the name of Lucia Rodriguez, who was from Tepatitlan, Jalisco, and she founded this very important uh, Mexican restaurant in San Bernardino. But the restaurant also played a crucial role in supporting these baseball and softball teams as well. Um, I wanna uh, single out a player here, Cruz Nevarez uh, on the top row, second from the left. Uh, Cruz Nevarez was born in Mexico, was brought to the US as a child, grew up in San Bernardino's west side played for the Meat La Cafe team. Um, and he also served in World War II as a combat medic. And in fact, he, he actually fought at the, the famous Battle of, of Normandy when he, he served in the war. Upon uh, his return, after the war concluded, he played for this Meat La team. Eventually, he used a lot of his organizing and leadership skills that he gained from the sport to become an integral member of the community and an activist for, for Mexican-American civil rights. Here you see uh, Cruz Nevarez on the far right here while he was stationed uh, in, in boot camp in Texas for boot camp for the army. Uh, this is in, in the 1940s. Uh, many simply remember him as Mr. Nevarez as he became, became one of the first Mexican-American teachers in the city of San Bernardino where he had a long successful career at San Bernardino High School teaching for, for many years. But perhaps Cruz Nevarez's greatest community contributions came through founding uh, San Bernardino's chapter of the community service organization in the 1950s. And what the CSO did was it, it helped to mobilize uh, the west side of San Bernardino by registering Mexican Americans to vote, by offering naturalization classes to Mexicans in the area, many of which uh, Cruz Nevarez taught himself. And here we have a photo of Cruz Nevarez at the far left while he was president of the CSO. Next to him is uh, Danny Landeros, who was a very important uh, figure in the IE as well, treasurer Helen Martinez. And at the far right is one of the co-founders of the CSO, uh, Fred Ross. And for those of you who don't know who Fred Ross is, he was a, a, a good friend and political ally, not only people like Cruz Nevarez, but of the Mexican and Mexican American community in general. He was a, one of the most important community organizers in, in 20th century US history, perhaps best known uh, for his organizing work with Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, the National Farm Workers Association and the UFW. In fact, uh, Ross brought Cesar Chavez to San Bernardino to work uh, alongside Nervares during the 1950s at one point. 
Uh, Cruz Navarro passed away in, in 2010, but I was fortunate enough to have spent some time with him, interview him a few months before his passing while I was still an undergrad at, at Cal State San Bernardino. In fact, he was one of my first oral history interviews and um, a, just an incredible figure, but also a former former softball player attributed a lot of his organizing and teamwork skills to playing the sport. Um, so I want to, before we go into this breakout session, I wanted to leave you all with these two images for the breakout session. Here on the left is Ernie Benzor of Riverside, who served in World War II from 1944 to 46. He also later served in, in the Korean War. Ernie grew up in the Riverside area. And uh, after the war concluded, he also played for the local baseball team seen here, uh, the Casa Blanca Aces in 1948. This team was comprised of primarily World War II Mexican-American veterans. Like many of his teammates, uh, Benzor, who's shown second row, second from right, is wearing his military belt on his uniform. Uh, and I'd like you all to think about uh, why they might be displaying their belts on their uniforms. Uh, think about maybe who their opponents are, what type of statements they might be saying to their opponents, and how Mexican Americans are utilizing baseball to make claims to civil rights. Uh, Danny, do you want to take it away for the breakout rooms? Absolutely. So on that note, uh, we're, we're going to go ahead and give you all the option of joining a breakout room. These are going to be the same rooms that we will then go into um, for the for the teacher support portion that follows Dr. Osegueda's talk. So uh, you can go ahead and self um, self select if you would like to um, go into a breakout room and have a discussion with your um, with some of your uh, teacher colleagues and folks that are. Um, here in the session. So you should see an option there on your screen. And if you click on it, you will see elementary, high school, and middle school. So feel free to join. I'm gonna go into the, the middle school one um, myself. And uh, maybe I can talk to him about it. Well, welcome back, everybody. We hope you all had uh, some, um, great conversations with your with your colleagues and your friends. Um, we're going to jump right back into this conversation, unless somebody has like a burning question that uh, maybe was brought up in your breakout room and and you want to ask um, Professor Osagela. If so, you could unmute, or you could also just drop that question in the chat. I think Danielle would be interesting for people to hear your question and then have. Um, the answer to that about the coordinating of the belts. Yeah, yeah. So the question I was asking uh, Dr. Osegueda was the, you know, sort of like the, the how it was communicated from the players to onlookers in the community and the, the sort of symbolism of the of the of wearing the belt that you wore while in the service. So that was a question I asked, and you want to go ahead sure, and take it? Yeah, no, it's a it's a great question, Danny. Um, so the, the information that I have on the Casa Blanca Isis and on Ernie Benzor, who's pictured here, comes from direct testimony and oral history from Ernie Benzor Jr., the son of uh, Ernie Benzor here, senior, that's pictured on the team and here in uniform. And essentially, uh, Ernie Benzor Jr. confirmed, you know, as the steward of this history here, that they indeed coordinated to place these belts on their uniforms to make strong political statements that as Mexican American uh, veterans that fought in World War II that really you know, made the ultimate sacrifice for the, not only their communities, but the, the United States, the nation, um, that they were deserving of, of attending integrated schools, not having to face discrimination um, and being treated with dignity, really, and as human beings. And so that's really kind of the statement that he said that his father and the others on the team were trying to make when displaying such belts. Yeah, that's amazing. 
Well, thank you for, for answering that question, Dr. Mosqueda. Yeah. It's, it's all yours. Um, no, so I, does it, I mean, does anyone else want to ask or contribute a comment? Sandra, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, um, I, my family, we're, we're four generations military and going from World War II until present time. So I believe the reason why they're wearing the belts, as you know, as it was said, it was a show of patriotism and, and pride that, hey, you know what, we are part of the American society and we should be treated equally as such, you know. Um, and with sports kind of in many ways serving in some respects as an equalizer right there, because we even see it today, how sports can serve as an equal opportunity for all uh, nationalities and cultures to show their, their pride and, and their um, patriotism as such. Um, I know that for me in, in my class, because I teach history here at uh, Diamond Valley Middle School for Hemet Unified School District. And even though I teach sixth grade and it's ancient history, I, I teach it from a multicultural point of view. So I tell everybody's story. So that's kind of where I, what I do. And I was talking to Christine um, who teaches at San Jacinto Unified. And in case you, you I don't know, I'm not sure if you guys were aware of, but San Jacinto Unified School District has done an excellent job of providing an ethnic studies class for their high school students as a choice. My son took that class and he really loved it because it was finally a, a history that he could actually relate to. And, and my, my children are Afro-Latinos, so they get to see their, their cultural history being in the forefront. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you for your comments, uh, Sandra. No, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. So the reason why I want to show these images is really to drive home the point, right, that these individuals here are making strong political statements about segregation, discrimination. And as veterans, they're using these venues, these recreational, these leisure sites to demand for access to these public spaces and to be treated as, as first, as a with dignity, essentially. Uh, Leo Baca here is also shown second row far from right. He was a sixth grade teacher at Casablanca Grammar School. So he, along with all the others, are very familiar with segregation and how it operated within the Casablanca community. Um, so through this baseball, um, it becomes a very important space to make these, these types of messages about discrimination, segregation, and, and civil rights. Um, okay, so now I, I want to I want to shift gears just a bit now to, to focus on other forms of activism, uh, civil rights and resistance among the Mexican American and Latinx communities in the Inland Empire. Uh, and I'd like to quickly discuss uh, Eugenio Nogueras and Ignacio Lopez. Uh, Eugenio Nogueras and Ignacio Lopez were instrumental figures for civil rights in the Inland Empire. Nogueras was a, a resident of San Bernardino's West Side, was the editor of El Sol de San Bernardino, from the early 1930s through, through uh, throughout most of the decade. And El Sol was a Spanish language weekly that was circulated widely, not only through the west side of San Bernardino, but also in other Inland Empire barrios. So that Spanish speaking Mexican and Mexican Americans could be informed on the crucial issues related to their communities. And El Sol initially circulated uh, 5,000 copies weekly but quickly after two years, it eventually grew to publish 20,000 copies every Friday, eventually becoming one of the most significant presses for Spanish speaking, Spanish reading residents in San Bernardino, the Inland Empire, and even a uh, greater Southern California. I'd also like to point out that Eugenio Nogueras in fact was not Mexican uh, or, or Mexican American. He was actually Puerto Rican and you know, he was a really unique figure in that he's living in this predominantly Mexican community as a Puerto Rican. And uh, it's really kind of complicating our notions of what Latinidad looks like in the Inland Empire. And he's actually still a very mysterious figure to me still. Um, there's very little that's available on him in archival records, but he was quite uh, interesting in that El Sol became this weekly 
venue to broadcast important information regarding civil rights, discrimination, and other news in the IE's uh, Latinx population. And similarly, uh, Ignacio Lopez from Ontario founded a Spanish language weekly that uh, was known as El Espectador in the 1930s. Lopez was an immigrant from Guadalajara, Mexico, who moved to Pomona with his father as a child. He eventually graduated from local schools, received his education at uh, Pomona College. In 1933, he started El Espectador and utilized this weekly, similarly to Eugenio Nogueras, to tackle issues of civil rights, discrimination, segregation, and to mobilize the community to take action on these issues. In fact, uh, Ignacio Lopez published on businesses like theaters and restaurants that segregated and denied access uh, to Mexicans to their businesses, and he called on the community uh, to boycott those that were known uh, to segregate and discriminate against Mexicans. He also uh, published on police violence against Mexican youth. In one case, he called for an investigation to the brutal beating uh, of a Mexican youth uh, that this particular Mexican youth received from three local police officers. So both of these figures here, Eugenio Nogueras and Ignacio Lopez, were very instrumental to civil rights in the IE. Both were actually close friends and allies and partners in these endeavors on, on working in, in media to publicize and spread information on these issues. Um, so not only they, were they important as journalists, they also really, really figure prominently in the next story that deals with uh, a San Bernardino civil rights court case that involves the, the Valles family in San Bernardino. Here's a, another image of Ignacio Lopez. Uh, so I wanna turn my attention to the Gonzales, the Gonzalo uh, and Jovita Valles family. So Jovita and Gonzalo Valles are shown here. They, they served as important members of San Bernardino's Mexican community. Uh, Gonzalo, for instance, he held elected positions in numerous Mexican organizations and also began a Spanish language radio program entitled Melodias Mexicanas that showcased Mexican music and upcoming artists scheduled to perform in San Bernardino. Uh, Gonzalo often booked such artists, uh, including Pedro Infante, uh, Mario Moreno, better known by a stage name of Cantinflas, and he booked these really prominent uh, artists at the Municipal Auditorium in downtown San Bernardino. Jovita, meanwhile, participated in the PTA, devoted much of her time in church activities at Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, where Gonzalo struck a close friendship with the, the parish priest, uh, Father Jose Nunez, who's also a, a, a significant uh, person in this, this particular story as well. When the US entered World War II, uh, the Valles family patriotically dedicated themselves to the war effort. Juvenal and Antonio, the two oldest sons, volunteered to serve in the US Army Air Corps while Gonzalo and Jovita contributed to the domestic front by holding war bond drives and even encouraging uh, their children to save their spare chains to buy war bonds. In 1943, for example, 11-year-old uh, Ruth Valles bought a $25 war bond after saving money for almost a year. And here on the image on the left, you can see Ruth Valles buying a war bond, holding the hammer. Uh, she's going to break her piggy bank open in this image to buy a war bond. Tragically, on May 30th, 1943, Gonzalo and Jovita Valles received the tragic news from the Army Air Corps that their son Juvenal, only 19 years old, died when his canoe capsized in a park lagoon uh, during a military exercise. When Juvenal's body arrived in San Bernardino, employees at the Mountain View Cemetery denied him burial due to his Mexican background. Initially, cemetery workers sold Gonzalo a plot and asked no questions regarding his racial background. Gonzalo apparently avoided the cemetery's racially restrictive covenants because he passed the uh, visual markers of racial difference since he had a lighter skin complexion. However, Gonzalo, uh, when he brought Jovita to view the plot, her darker complexion aroused suspicion from the cemetery staff. They promptly asked them if they were Mexican. Uh, Gonzalo confirmed that they were. And this revelation led to the cemetery's sudden and unexpected decision to cancel Juvenal's burial only one day before the funeral. Gonzalo and the Mexican community immediately resisted the cemetery's stance, including uh, the Spanish language newspaper editors Eugenio Nogueras and Ignacio Lopez, 
who published about the refusal of burial in their papers. After extensive collaboration with the Spanish language press, the Catholic Church, and through the support of white allies like the Congress member Harry Shepard, the cemetery finally agreed to bury Juvenal and a funeral was held on June 10th of 1943. Uh, Judith Vias, the youngest daughter of the Vias family, uh, some of you might uh, recognize the name. Uh, uh, Judith Vias was the mayor of San Bernardino, uh, elected in 1988, re-elected in 2002. This is actually uh, was her older brother. And here in an oral history interview that I co uh, conducted with uh, Judith Vias, she, she stated, my brother's body was in our home for what seemed like a very long time. Must have been about two weeks, but there he was in his coffin in our living room. At times, my father would open the coffin and allow people to come and see him. So this is a, a this very traumatic incident that occurs regarding the, the Vias family. After the terrible ordeal that the Vias family experienced in getting Juvenal buried, only two, month, two months passed when their youngest son, Mike Vias, was refused admittance into the Paris Hill Park swimming pool in San Bernardino. Mike had rode his bike with his friend uh, to the plunge as well, and, and he was told to come back on, on the Mexican day to swim. Segregated swimming pools were typical during this era for people of color throughout the US. Uh, they couldn't swim at, at public pools except for one day out of the week, usually the, the day before the pool scheduled cleaning. When Mike Vias returned home, told his parents of the incident at the Paris Hill pool, Gonzalo's outrage deepened given the continued discrimination directed not only at the, at the Mexican community, but his family as well. Eventually, Gonzalo once again teamed up with Ignacio Lopez and Eugenio Nogueras, along with the local uh, Catholic parish priest from Our Lady of Guadalupe, Father Jose Nunez, uh, to sue the city of San Bernardino for their role in segregating public parks and recreational facilities. Ignacio Lopez uh, contacted a Jewish American Los Angeles based attorney by the name of David C. Marcus to represent the defense committee and pursue legal action against the city of San Bernardino. And one of the reasons he had to go to Los Angeles to uh, get a, a, an attorney was that no local attorneys in San Bernardino would dare uh, challenge uh, the, the city of San Bernardino. Many of them who were friends with uh, the city council members and mayors. So he had to go outside of the community and contact David C. Marcus. On September 17th, 1943, Father Jose Nunez, Eugenio Noguera, Ignacio Lopez, and attorney David Marcus filed a, uh, appeared before a federal court judge, uh, Leon Yankvich, and filed a class action lawsuit on behalf of the Mexican residents of the city, arguing that as taxpayers and citizens, they were entitled to use parks and recreational facilities, and that to deny them access was unconstitutional under the, the 5th and 14th Amendments. This case was uh, filed as Lopez versus Seacom, and Judge Yankvich directed Mayor William Seacom of San Bernardino to show cause for the pool's segregated facilities. Attempting to explain the pool's admission policy, uh, the mayor stated that cleanliness and hygiene served as the primary admission qualification and that no racial ban existed for admittance into the Paris Hill Plunge. Ignacio Lopez uh, and, and Father Nunez strategically ran an admittance trial to test this rationale that, that the mayor gave. There's a lot of eugenics and public health and racist public health uh, logic being applied here by the mayor, but uh, Lopez and Father Nunez, they, they come together and they have three children purposefully, neatly and cleanly dressed before arriving to the pool. Accompanied by the priest, Father Jose Nunez, the children approach the entrance to swim when the pool manager predictably refused them entry and made no reference to their hygiene as basis for non-admission. Ignacio Lopez reported on the incident and stated, last Tuesday afternoon, Nunez and the Mexican children of his parish were refused admittance to the San Bernardino Municipal Plunge because they were Mexicans. They were, they were refused the use of a swimming pool that displays a bronze plaque that says no one is to be refused admittance because of race or color. Um, so through this test, uh, the defense committee, uh, Father Nunez, the Valles family, they essentially dismantled uh, Mayor William Seacombe's hygiene rationale, right? He, they, they came with uh, essentially three children 
dressed to the nines. And as a result, Judge Yankovic issued a, a permanent injunction restraining city officials from barring Mexican Americans from recreational facilities in late December of 1943 thus becoming one of the earliest successful class action legal challenges to desegregate public facilities in US history. So uh, in a very, very important court case is Lopez versus Seacom and it occurred in San Bernardino. Um, this was also similarly to how I showed there was black, uh, there was a black students that were segregated. There was also a, almost a more than almost 20 years earlier the Black community and the Mexican community were experiencing the same thing. So here you have Frank Johnson, uh, who was a, a Black resident of Riverside. And in 1921, when his daughter wasn't allowed to swim in the Fairmount Park plunge, he similarly uh, protested this uh, ban. The city responded by building and opening a, a segregated uh, park near the Black community in Riverside, Lincoln Park. Um, and it was on the east side. It was built in 1924. So this was, um, though the park at Fairmount was not desegregated, he was at least able to have a, a pool built for the black community by the city of Riverside. But I just wanna show this because it really parallels these ex experiences of segregation in the IE. Perhaps one of the most important takeaways from the swimming pool case in San Bernardino is that uh, Lopez versus Seacom represented an early legal battle that set precedent for a larger movement within Southern California and throughout the country that sought to dismantle segregation. Uh, so for instance, news of the victory in San Bernardino made waves in Southern California's Mexican communities. It eventually caught the attention of Orange County residents, uh, Gonzalo and Felicitas Mendez. The Mendez family, along with four other families, they subsequently contacted the same attorney in the San Bernardino case, David C. Marcus and they hired him to represent them in their effort to desegregate public schools for Mexican children. Uh, now in March of 1945, Marcus filed another class action lawsuit against four Orange County school districts for their role in segregating Mexican children. And in this case, Marcus expanded on the same 14th Amendment argument and legal strategy that he implemented in San Bernardino in the swimming pool case. Um, and of course, this, uh, this particular case, Mendes versus Westminster, uh, it becomes a very influential case, right? Many of you are probably familiar with it. It's uh, connections to the landmark Brown versus Board of Education decision of, in 1954. And it becomes a case that leads uh, California to desegregate schools uh, throughout the state. Um, however, though this case, Mendes versus Westminster, is, is properly acknowledged for demonstrating the role that Mexican Americans played in desegregation of public schools at the national level, the narrative surrounding the case needs to be further complicated. And I, I argue that Lopez versus Seacom, this swimming pool case sets a, a very important legal precedent for Mendes versus Westminster. And you can see here, uh, Judge Denman, who was a circuit court judge, what he says in Mendes versus Westminster, and uh, he, he directly references the San Bernardino case, the, the, the priest, the two journalists, Ignacio Lopez and Eugenio Nogueras, and he cites it as being uh, essentially a huge influence in the Mendes decision. <clears throat> Additionally, the fact that San Bernardino's uh, defense committee eventually targeted the mayor, council members, the police chief, it becomes a very important case that targeted um, these kind of these daily gatekeepers of white supremacy in, in San Bernardino and the Inland Empire. So it's very important, especially given that the production of race um, in many cases rested upon the discretion of people like cemetery staff workers, right? Or uh, pool workers. Uh, I also wanna highlight the Catholic church's role in this case. Father Jose Nunez was uh, a direct plaintiff in Lopez versus Sicom. Uh, he's really uh, uh, an influential figure in the west side of San Bernardino an important community member. And this is him uh, uh, sh being shown here with uh, the successor to William Seacom, uh, the, the mayor after William Seacom and the city attorney in 1947. Um, so I just wanna conclude, uh, this is a, an important case, Lopez versus Seacom. It really kind of allows historians, uh, educators to reimagine Southern California, Mexican-American history 
uh, with spaces like San Bernardino and the Inland Empire as integral components to that narrative uh, that we think about when we think about civil rights and social movements. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll end it with that. Here's a, a list of resources that you all might want to look at if you're interested in these histories, um, some primary sources and also some secondary literature. Uh, yeah, so, so thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Osagata. Let's give a round of applause, unmute and, and applause for that terrific talk. Um, that was not an easy talk to give. I mean, uh, um, Mark, you made it look pretty easy, but you, you navigated a lot of different topics. Um, so really appreciate you um, presenting it in that way. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was really great to hear about all these local examples. Um, and I also just wanna let folks know who are here that that book, the Jose Aramillo book, Making Lemonade Out of Lemons is now being offered as a book that you can choose. Um, I think on our survey or evaluation, there's an option for you to choose the book. Uh, Genevieve Carbio's book and Matt Garcia's book um, are also options there. And then uh, Mark's dissertation actually was sharing some of that uh, today in, the, in, in our breakout rooms. Um, so thanks again. And this is a good time before we transition into our, our breakout rooms. If anybody has a follow-up question or um, a, a question in general for Dr. Osagueda, this is a, the, the time to ask. Well, I, uh, yeah, so we're just hearing excellent work, another great scholar from Christine. So thank you so much, Mark. And um, we are going to transition now to um, our breakout room. So we have a very small group here as we're winding down towards the end. So um, this is gonna be nice and, and, um, and intimate and allow us to engage in some good conversations. So folks who are here that are elementary teachers are gonna be joining um, our colleague Amparo and she is going to um, show you some terrific resources and some, some great um, materials for you. Uh, if you're a middle school teacher, you're going to be joining me. Um, and I'm gonna, we're going to be doing some lesson plan brainstorming together using this, this topic and some of these resources. And if you're here for uh, your high school and ethnic studies teacher or high school or ethnic studies teacher, you're going to be joining Don in the high school uh, breakout room. Okay, so go ahead and self-select, and uh, I'm going to jump into my breakout room, and uh, all of us are going to do that, and we'll see you in, in those breakout rooms. Sure. Um, Amparo, did you want to take this, or did you want me to, do, to take sure. this last part? I can do that. Um, we were just wondering how the sources today and Professor Segueda's conversation with us was helping some of you rethink, reimagine how you approach teaching uh, Latinx history in your courses. If one or two of you wanna put something in the chat or unmute yourself, we'd love to hear. Um, it also helps us to know if what we think makes sense to you, right? <laughs> so please, if you can share with us, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, well, there was like some really good, I, I don't know if, um... Senator or Christine, if they want to talk, but there's some really good conversation happening in um, in our breakout room about um, it's just kind of like some of these stories and how they parallel these larger themes in uh, in U.S. history, um, and and then the question about like how many more of these stories are out there that we're not aware of. Oh, and to piggyback to what Danny was saying, um, a true historian or history teacher would actually make the extra effort to find that extra information to present it to the kids, okay, uh, to their students. Because um, I know for me, since I do teach history, but I do teach it from a multicultural point of view, so I tell everybody's story, okay? And, and I made, I've had consciously made that effort for many years. Okay, but as, as Danny and Christine and I we were talking, you know, the how, how a lot of the themes parallel with other groups, like, for instance, you know, talking about in the in the Greek community, you know, do they have um, schools where they sent the children to learn about the Greek language and the Greek culture, 
you know, that is not taught in the schools, you know. Um, I know for me growing up, you know, I, I'm originally from Calexico in the Imperial Valley, but I've had lived in San Diego and I live in Hemet San Jacinto. So I, I'm, I'm a SoCal girl, but even in these three areas, the, the community, the culture is so different, you know, and you have to assimilate in, in many ways. Um, Cause like I said, in Hemet San Jacinto, um, it's it's not it's segregated not segregated how can I say it you could tell which neighborhood belongs to which nationality you just you just know I think that that's uh I think that we're very fortunate in many ways that uh, a lot of these archives are digitized and we have access to them right those of us who have been teaching for a little while um can remember having to go to the library and look through books and microfiche and <laughs> to uncover some of these on your own. So I, I, I love that you're talking about like, we have this great opportunity and I think it's wonderful. And I love the comments about engaging students and bringing materials to students that are gonna connect to them. Cause I think that those are all really, really, really important um, for, for our students and, and, and getting them prepared for college even, right? How do you, compare these different versions of history and documents and, and that could really spark that love for history. So thank you everyone um, who commented in, in, the, in the chat. Um, we wanna wrap up and remind you that we will be meeting again March 10th um, and we will have Professor Matt Garcia with us uh, that day. It's gonna be exciting to look at youth culture, music and dance. And we also wanna tell you about another um, opportunity that we are going to be hosting starting next week around uh, Black History Month. Um, we are very excited to have Professor LeGarrette King join us to talk about his six principles for teaching uh, Black stories. And then a local historian from the Pacoima Historical Society will be sharing the history of Black uh, Pacoima. And then uh, Professor um, Allison Rose Jefferson will be talking to us um, about the Belmar community, uh, which is a community in Santa Monica that was um, mostly uh, African-American. And she's gonna be talking about the intersection of leisure and culture and race and ethnicity in uh, the Inkwell in Santa Monica. So we- Yeah, a lot, to the, mm -hmm, and a lot of oh, parallels to the- A lot of parallels to the talk today. Right, with like looking at like a, a leisure spaces and, and the, like the way the civil rights movement played out in, in Southern California is really unique. Um, those were contested spaces. Uh, so that, that talk by uh, um, Professor uh, Jefferson in, in, in April is, is something that uh, we would, we, we hope you all join us and we have a really great curriculum to, to go with that, with that talk. Um, well, that's about it, folks. Uh, we do want Danny, Danny. Yeah, yeah. How much is that? It's free. It's what? <laughs> it's free. Free. Awesome. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Don. Uh, folks, just fill, uh, we're going to ask you to fill out your evaluation. It's on your agenda, um, and it's also in the chat. You can fill that out. Great. Otherwise, thank you all so much.